Open your Bibles, please, and turn to Matthew chapter number 6, Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew 5, the great, greatest sermon ever preached by the Lord Jesus Christ, the Sermon on the Mount. We want to start reading in chapter 5 and verse 38, Matthew 5 and verse 38. Again, I'm thankful very much to have the opportunity to be here with you and see you again and Thank you for uh, beautiful accommodations, and we've had a good time. Tomorrow morning, we'll be headed uh, north to Michigan, hopefully make it. We're trying to care for my mom, and I'd like you to pray for my mother. She's uh, 98 years old. She called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. She said that her children were playing in the living room and in the kitchen, and, and, uh, and so I talked to her a little bit, and I said, well, I'll go with you. I'm on the phone. You know, I said, let's go in and talk with the children. And uh, so we went in, she went in there, heard her walking around, and well, they're gone, she said. And I didn't know if they were having any children. She's praying every day that God will take her home. And, but she, her mind gets confused and, and that, but uh, she seemed to be doing, I talked to her later on today, uh, doing better. And then my father-in-law, he's been sick. He lives right behind us. And we got two seniors, we're both seniors, and we got two older seniors who are trying to help. And, and we're praying the Lord willing, and my, my mom goes to be the Lord. God directs, we'd like to move down here and be part of this great church. And uh, so you pray about that with us too. I'd like you to notice in Matthew 5, verse 38, 44, Matthew 5, verse 38. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if a man will sue thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give unto him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, complete, mature, even as your Father which in heaven, in heaven is perfect. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing of it. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you'd give us physical strength and, and spiritual perception, open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your word. Challenge us, Lord, to be willing to go that second mile for you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Notice with you would, as the disciples uh, are gathered around and many people and Jesus is teaching and the Jews hated the Romans. And Jesus is preaching and he says to them, don't just go with them a mile. They hated that. Having to carry those Romans' bags a mile. Jesus said, no, go with them too. Now, that didn't go over very well, I don't think. <coughs> hey, Jew, carry my bag. Right here. We're going this way. Hurry up. Pulls out a sword. I said, you're carrying my bag. Okay. <laughs> and we're going that way. Let's go. Come on. Ah. I don't want any back talk from you. You just keep going. I, my son has told me about you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll do, this. we'll do trial number two. Since he's so stubborn on the first try. <laughs> All right, Jew, carry my bag. Yes, sir. 
even, even smiling about it. All right, you've made it a mile. That's all you have to do. You can put it down. You're supposed to want to go the second mile. <laughs> what are you doing? Hey, I'd love, let me help you carry another mile. I'd love to what? Carry out another Why mile. would you want to do that? Well, I'm a follower of Christ now. Well, okay. If you in my life. I'd well, love to help you out another mile. I'd like to hear about this Jesus. Man, he's changed my life. He's done a work. Amen. I'd love to share Let's give you. him a hand. That's pretty good, wasn't it? Uh, we didn't get a chance to practice, so, but you got the idea. I want to say to you tonight, the second mile is where the fun is. The second mile is where the blessing is. The second mile is when you've gone beyond your duty that God steps in. When you've gone beyond just the average and the normal. You know, most people today aren't even doing their duty. Think about it. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke, I believe it's chapter number 17. I'd, I'd like for you to look at another verse. Luke, chapter 17, and verse number 10. The Romans ruled, and they had uh, the authority to command a Jew to carry their uh, baggage one mile. There were about 50,000 miles of roads, and they all led to Rome. And the soldiers could at any time command somebody to carry the mile. And Jesus is teaching here, and he says, do more than just what the Pharisees do. Do more than just show. Do more than just talk. Amen. Do more and go the second mile. And do the second mile for me. Let me encourage you to do what you do for the Lord. Even though people will sometimes not be happy and complain and not be satisfied, if you do what you do for the Lord, you'll be blessed. And we hear, see in Luke chapter 17 and verse 10, notice what the Bible says here. So likewise ye, when you have done all those things which are commanded you, you've done your duty, we are unprofitable servants. Most people would want a pat on the back and boy, you're really something. You, you did your duty. He says, no, we're unprofitable servants. And then he says, we have done that which was our duty to do. Now, what is your duty? You know, if you look that up in the Webster 1828 dictionary, it says that which a person owes to another. You know, Paul said, I'm a debtor right. to the Jew and to the Greek. We're a debtor to our forefathers who fought so that we could have pr freedom. We're a debtor to Christians that burned at the stake and sacrificed and, and gave and were beaten and put in dungeons and on and on we could go because so that we could have the word of God, so that we could have freedom here tonight. That which we owe to another. Uh, that, by that which a person is bound by any natural, moral, legal, legal, or spiritual obligation to pay, do, or perform. Uh, duty binds us and creates an attachment. So uh, nobody likes doing somebody else's work. And people don't even want to do their own work. You know, they don't even want to do their duty. But the Lord challenges them and says, go a second mile. Go a second mile. There's a long, young lady's uh, obituary. Uh, That's not obituary. What do you call these cards? Yeah, the, the funeral homes give them out. Anyway, this is Stephanie. Stephanie was a pretty young girl. I met, led her to the Lord, uh, brought her to church a lot of times, tried to reach the family. They were a rough family. Mom and dad were motorbike riders, and that doesn't mean you're bad, but they were kind of with the bad gang, you know, and, and that type of thing. Anyway, uh, they came, she came to church, and I tried to witness to the parents, and eventually she uh, quit coming to the church. 
And I lost track of them, didn't know where they were. One day I got a phone call from Mrs. Hall, and she says, Stephanie's died. Would you preach her funeral? I said, what happened to Stephanie? She said, well, she started dating this boy, and we told her he wasn't any good. He had nice cars and lots of money, and gave her all kinds of gifts. The big problem was he was a drug dealer. Now, she thought she'd change him, but she didn't. She got the drugs and died. Left two little girls. It wasn't after that we continued to try to work with the parents. And through the accident, I was able to leave Mr. and Mrs. Hall. Their last name was Hall to the Lord. And we all knew when they come to church because they'd come riding in with their Harleys. You know, <laughs> and they're loud. And, uh, and we worked with them and I took them flying. And we just tried to go the second mile to work with those people. And it wasn't too long that Mr. Hall died. And his wife asked me uh, to come and to do his funeral. And at his funeral, there was a lot of bikers. It was the roughest crowd I have ever seen, you know. It, they were rough. And, man, I, I preached the gospel and, uh, and told them how that Mr. Hall had gotten saved. Can't remember his first name right now. But, but uh, when I gave the invitation, 37 people raised their hand that they had prayed and ask Jesus to come into their hearts. You know, sometimes you feel like you're just spinning your wheels and nothing's happening, but if you keep going, if you're faithful and you're willing to do what God wants you to do, God will bless. My wife and I were knocking on some doors uh, a, a year or so ago uh, on the Lothrop Road that I grew up on, and we came to a house, a guy's name was Bill. Bill was a, a bouncer for a bar for a long time, He'd had five different wives. He was a rough character. And, and he wasn't interested in God or the church at all. But he had a nice bass boat out front. And I started talking to him about that bass boat, about fishing. First thing, you know, he was out showing us his boat and tell us in, about it. Well, over the next year, you know, we went back about six weeks later on a follow-up visit and... Uh, Bill said, you know, every night when I'm laid down, he said, I've got that track that you gave me. And I, I look at it and pray. And uh, so we kept working with him and, and came bass fishing. He started calling me to go bass fishing with him. And so I started going bass fishing. He was a real good bass fisherman. He had real expensive poles and reels, like $900 for his setup, you know. And uh, we were out there fishing one day, and I got a nice bass, and he laid his pole down and, and netted a nice bass I got. We got some three- and four-pounders, pretty nice ones. Anyway, uh, when we turned around, his pole was gone. Something had grabbed it, or it hooked the bottom, and the boat's drifting. I don't know what happened, but his pole was gone. And, boy, he was upset, and we cast and tried to catch it for about 20, 30 minutes, see if we could catch the line. We couldn't. And I said, well, let's have a word of prayer, and I have a word of prayer with him and said, Lord, help us to find that. And I cast out and I said, Bill, there's a line. He grabbed it and pulled it in. He said, it's a miracle. <laughs> and he started telling people, he said, that preacher, what he prays for things happen. And he asked me to pray for this person, pray for that person. It wasn't long I took the deacon over to his place and uh, he, he did uh, butchering for deer hunting and Anyway, we took a deer over there and another uh, time. Anyway, we were able to witness to him, and Bill prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart. Wasn't too long after that, Bill got cancer, and Bill died. They asked me to come and prayed with him before he died. And his brother was there and said, Hey, I want to know how Bill ever got around a preacher. And so I told him the story, and I said, told him how Bill had prayed and trusted Christ. He said, I said, isn't that right, Bill? He said, yep. And uh, witnessed everybody that was in the room as he was dying. And then when he died, I, I preached, and one woman came and said, well, I'm Bill's first wife. I said, well, very good to be true. And I'm, like, I'm Bill's second wife, you know. <laughs> Several other wives came. I didn't ask them, are you three, four, or five, you know. <laughs> but I was able to preach the gospel to a whole big group just because we went the second mile. We didn't give up the first time. Aren't you glad God didn't give up in you the first time? Aren't you glad the Lord keeps working 
on us. You know, the first mile is crowded, but the second mile, there's lots of room. There's many people that are willing to do what's required, what's expected, but there's very few people that are willing to go the extra mile. I found when you come to the end of yourself and you've done everything you can do, that's when God enters in. That's when God will help you. I like in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 26, where it says, Jesus went a little further. I want to ask you, what did Jesus go a little further in? How about fasting? <laughs> How about prayer? How about healing the sick and raising the dead? How about living a sinless life? How about pleasing his heavenly father? How about going to the cross and paying for all our sins? Jesus went the second mile, didn't he? And you need to think about, am I willing to just do my duty? If you're still in Matthew or maybe you're in Luke, you want to flip back to Matthew. One of the key verses is in verse number 20, 5 and verse 20. There the Bible, Jesus speaking, says, For I say unto you, do accept your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, righteousness doesn't come by works. Righteousness comes through putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Righteousness comes by the, the imputed righteousness of Christ on our account that covers all our sin. But this, this Beatitudes is actually teaching sanctification, how that we can be sanctified as a Christian if we will do those things that God has called us to do. Matthew 26, 39. You know, in the first few verses, verse 3, and it talks about our attitude towards ourself. It talks about our attitude towards sin in verse Four to six, and our attitude towards the Lord, our attitude towards the world, our attitude towards forgiveness. Look, if you would, at Matthew chapter 6. You know, a lot of Christians aren't willing to forgive those that have hurt them. In Matthew chapter 6, we know the Lord's Prayer. And he says there in verse 11, 6, 11, give unto this day, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do you have something in your life, somebody, something you haven't let go of? Get forgiveness. Be a second mile Christian. Forgive those that have wronged you. You know, there's a lot of examples here about being a second mile Christian. I want you to just notice in the few verses we read there in verse 41, he's talking about the Pharisees going the first mile. But Jesus said, as a Christian, you ought to go the second mile. He talks about turning the other cheek and, and, and letting vengeance, God, judge your enemies. He's, he talks about in verse 41, the first mile Christian and uh, the second mile Christian, to be that second mile Christian. Then notice, if you would, in verse 33, he says, You have heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But here's the second mile that I say I need to love your enemies. You know, a lot of the people that anger us, a lot of the people that maybe upset us, you know, the Muslims need Jesus. Amen. When we were in Israel, the, uh, we used to go to Bethlehem Bible College, Dr. Bashara. You're dealing with a Jew. Don't ever tell them you're a Christian. If you tell them you're a Christian, they'll think you're a Catholic. If you're dealing with a Jew, tell them you're a Baptist. And you know what they'll say? What's a Baptist? Boom. You got opportunity to witness. Dr. Bashara, and I've heard testimonies of many different Muslims that have seen a vision at night, have seen an angel or the Lord. I don't know what. To the fact that Dr. Bashara puts ads in the paper and says, if you've seen the white angel or some type of wording, and people respond to that. You know, God loves everyone. Could you say John 3, 16 with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting. Amen. I got most of it. You know, the Bible wants us to love one another. It's sad when Christians can't love one another. Let me ask you, are you doing your duty? That's the first step. And then, are you willing, with God's help and God's power, to be a second-mile Christian? I'm talking about not just somebody that reads a little bit of the Word, but reads as much as they have time to read. As willing not just to pray a little prayer, but is willing, like we heard this morning, to stay with God in prayer. Not willing to just memorize a verse or two, but memorize passages and hide the Word of God and meditate on the Word Day and night, the Bible says, then you'll have good success. I'd like us to look through the Bible for just a few minutes and see some different ones in the Bible that were second-mile Christians. And how during that second mile, that was, it was, it's hard carrying that pack the first mile, but when he, when he carried that second mile, and he says, why are you doing this? Why do you love me? Why are you helping me? Why are you caring for me? Why do you do this? Well, because Jesus has changed my life. When people see a difference in your life, that's when you have an opportunity to witness. Because you were a second mile Christian. Notice, if you would, in Genesis chapter 24. In Genesis chapter 24, you have a wonderful story of Abraham sending his servant to get a bride for Isaac. And it's a picture of us, the the bride of Christ. And it's a wonderful picture, but what I want you to think about is they travel all this way and they meet Rebecca. And um, she's related and they uh, talk with her and she's a worker. She's willing to water all them camels. I don't know if you've ever seen a camel suck up a five gallon pail of water. How many have ever seen that? Nobody. A camel, you can take a five-gallon pail, fill it right up, and he can put his nose down in it, and in just a few seconds, he'll suck that whole pail right up. And he can do that four or five times. And this woman's got to pull that water up, you know, with some kind of a mechanical crank or something to get that water down there up here, not just to feed one camel, but a whole bunch of camels. So this woman was a willing woman and a working woman, and... And anyway, verse number 58, it's a long story, but we just want to look. Finally, they say in verse 58, and they called Rebekah and said to her, wilt thou go with this man? Now, what are they asking her to do? They're asking her to leave her country or her area and travel hundreds of miles with these men that she doesn't know on a camel and go marry somebody she's never met. Huh? That's a second mile, isn't it? <laughs> now, I'm sure she asked some questions. What does he look like? Is he tall, dark, and handsome? You know what? Well, you know, I know that she knew they had a lot of money because they brought treasures and things and that she's going to be provided for. But nevertheless, she obeyed the will of God. She became famous in the scriptures as the wife of one of the patriarchs, and she, she went and, uh, and married him. That's something, isn't it? Now, Turn over a couple more pages. We see the story of Isaac. Do you remember Isaac had such a great uh, possessions and herds and people that the Philistines said in verse 16 to Isaac, and Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much what? Much what? You're much mightier than we. So he sent him away. So they moved away and they, they needed water. So in verse 19 and 20, Isaac's servants worked and worked and they dug a well. Let me tell you, it's a lot of work to dig a well. I've tried to dig wells, hand wells before. Haven't been successful. But uh, they, uh, they dug a well and they know how to pack stones in around as they dig down. And they know how to lower pails and pull pails out and People are working down there. Did all this work to dig this well way down. And then the Philistines came and said, we want this well. Look at it in verse 20. And the herdsmen of Gear did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, uh, saying, this is our water. They wanted something they didn't dig. Now, who's the mightier? Who's the strongest? Isaac. Did he have to move? He could have told them to stick a Perkins pickle in their ear. 
I don't know if you like pickles, but I never had one in my ear. But anyway, we used to say that. Uh, listen, he said, okay, I'm not going to fight you over it. They moved down a ways and they dug another well. Did all that work. And notice in verse 21, and they dug another well and strove for that also. They came and said, we want this one too. There's a lot of people who want handouts, thinks everybody's supposed to be given to them. He didn't say, forget it, we're not digging another one. We gave you one. No, he moved over again. He dug another well. Do you think he went the second mile? Did God bless him? I want you to notice the next couple of verses. And the Bible says in verse 22, the last part of it, for now the Lord hath made room for us. We need to let God deal with problems rather than taking things up ourselves. He waited on the Lord and the Lord made room for him. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. We have a whole list of second mile Christians in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11. You have named those that walk with God by faith and that were second mile Christians. We think of the, the, uh, the first one mentioned is Abel. Abel obeyed God and did what God said and offered a blood sacrifice and God accepted it. He was a second mile Amen. Christian. You know, Cain, he brought the works of his own hands. He brought what he wanted to bring. We see there with Enoch in verse 5, Enoch walked with God. Not just a little bit. He walked with God. He stayed with God. And the Bible says God took him. Do you think he had a second mile Christian testimony? Verse 5, the last part of it, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know, when you're trying to make a decision for something, it's always a good question. Would this please God? If it doesn't, stay away from it. Yeah, I believe this will please God. He was a second mile Christian. Noah, do you think building that huge ark and working at it for 120 years, was that a second mile Christian? And God blessed him and preserved him and his family. You just keep going through down there with, with Moses and all the great ones we think. Was that a second mile Christian that walked with God? Say, yes, he was. Let's think of somebody else in the New Testament. You know, I think of the, the story of the prodigal son and we think of the, the father that was willing to forgive and take him back. Aren't you glad we have a heavenly father that runs to us when we turn towards him? You know, the Bible says, draw nigh to God. and He'll draw nigh to us. Uh, the good Samaritan, look at Luke 10. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. Religion turned by the other way and ritual turned by the other way and tradition turned by the other way. They didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to help him. They didn't want to spend time. They wanted to get home to their family. But the Bible says Jesus is the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. And he had compassion on him. And he came and bound up his wounds and poured in oil, a type of the Holy Spirit. And the, the wine, or the, uh, the uh, uh, wine is a picture of joy and poured that into him. I think it's also a picture of the Holy Spirit. He brought him to the inn, a picture maybe of the church, and took care of him. He said, I'll give you two pence. Maybe that's the Old and New Testament and the host, the pastor. But what I wanted to show you is he was willing to pay to help this man. Jesus paid to help all of us, didn't he? Are you willing to be a second mile of Christian if God was willing to do all these things for us? Would you be a second mile Christian? How about Zacchaeus? I won't turn there. Luke 19, but Jesus says, today is salvation. Come to your house. Not just when he got saved, but when he stood up and says, he's going to give half that he has to the poor. I mean, it went far beyond the call of duty. He was willing to go the second mile and God rewarded little Zacchaeus. The second mile is a mile with the opportunity to witness. The second mile is that mile of sacrifice. It'll cost you some time and effort. The second mile is that mile of commitment and discipleship. That uh, You have the discipleship programs in your church. Praise God for that. The second mile is a mile of deliverance where God will get involved and deliver you. The second mile uh, is a mile of birthing and uh, re-energizing. Re it's a, a mile of healing 
It's a mile of liberty and being set free, like my wife was singing about. Uh, what does it cost? What does it mean to be a second mile Christian? It means that we're willing to die to self and sin in our willing way. It means we're willing to swallow our pride and abandon self-interest. It means that we're willing to be slow to anger and quick to forgive. It means that we're willing to show grace to those around us. Jesus went a little further for you and for me. He said, greater love hath no man in this but a man would lay down his life for his friend. Let me ask you something. Don't just be concerned or worried about doing something to please the pastor or doing something to just do your duty. Say, Lord, I want to be a second mile Christian for you. I want to be a living sacrifice. In closing, I'd like you to look at the last verse. In Romans chapter 12, we all know this great verse. That's talking about reasonable service. God just asked for reasonable service after all he's done for us. In Romans 12, and notice the scripture says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Notice that. Your reasonable service. It may not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which the, that, that, what that, uh, it can prove that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Would you bow your heads?